I have arrived at the pinnacle of my career. And I mean that, everybody. You know, you have dreams. You have dreams, maybe you'll win an Emmy. Maybe you'll have a number one New York Times bestseller. Maybe you'll do this and that, all that I've done. But I've had one really, really big dream. And that is to stand on the Apollo stage and talk money to all of you. Now, here's what I find fascinating about all of you. It is 15 minutes late from the start time. And I've been standing over there for 15 minutes. <laughs> and all of you, or some of you, were out there drinking. <laughs> and you didn't want to stop drinking before you came in here. And do you know what I was told? I was told you were scared. The topic was about money. You had to be drunk to sit in an audience with <laughs> Susie Orman. Listen, I love talking to women, an entire audience of women, and the men smart enough to come as well. <laughs> yeah, you have to think about it. It takes courage as a man to come to a show called Women and Money. So you got to give them credit, right? But I love talking to women more about money than anything else. And here's the reason why. The future is female. And this is the year this is the year that all of you need to have a financial voice. I understand very well what's been happening with the Me Too and the Time's Up movement. And I just want to talk about that for just a second here. I want us all to think about why as women, why would we, and every one of us has experienced this, why would we put ourselves in a situation that wasn't respectful to ourselves? Why would we say yes, okay, when we're thinking, no, I don't want to do this, I don't like you, you're ugly, whatever it is, but, well, when you think about what, never mind, I won't go there, right? But, but when you think about it, why would we do that? Who said that? Girlfriend got it right. Did you hear what she said? She needed the money. We need the money. You need the job. You need the promotion. You need the part. You need whatever because you need money. And what do you need money for, ladies? To take care of your families. And you know and I know that a woman will do anything to take care of her family. Anything. So it's not enough just for this movement to say, no, I'm not going to do it, and for all of us to support one another in it. It's not enough. What is enough is when you have power over the money that you have. What's enough is when you don't have to say yes because you don't care if you don't get that job. You don't care if you don't get that part. You don't care because why? You have enough money to be able to be secure. So what is the goal of money, ladies? How many of you in this room feel secure right here and right now? Oh, a few of you, but not all of you. It needs to be every single one of you in this room. Because if you're not secure, then what are you? You're insecure. And when you're insecure, that means you are afraid. And when you are afraid, you have rendered yourself powerless. And when you are powerless, the number one law of money kicks into place. Open up your notebooks and start to take notes.
because this isn't a night, everybody, just to entertain you. This is an amateur night at the Apollo. <laughs> it's not. This is, in my opinion, the most important night, the most important hour and a half that you have ever spent in your lives. Because this night is about you. It's about empowering you. It's about telling you what to do with your money. It's about telling you what not to do with your money. It's about telling you that it's okay when your relatives say to you, give me some of your money, because I don't have any money, that you say no. <laughs> oh. Mm -hmm. You say no out of love for yourselves versus yes out of fear of what everybody else will think about you. Any of you relate to that in this audience? Do any of you have the courage when your brother or your sister, very different, by the way, when it's your parents. I have this belief that when it's your parents, you have to do anything you can to help them. They gave you birth, they're your mom, they're your dad, okay? There are exceptions to every rule, obviously. <laughs> but overall, parents, yes. But here you are, you make money, you put some away for yourself, and all of a sudden your sister comes to you, who hasn't worked in I don't know how long. <laughs> She already borrowed $5,000 from you a few years ago and never paid you back. And she comes to you and she says, I really need $2,000, please. And you're thinking, I'm not giving you that $2,000. And you're feeling, are you kidding me? You don't work. I work so hard. What are you talking about? And yet, what do you do? You go and you either write her a check, if you even write checks anymore, or somehow you give her $2,000. Why is that, women? Why do you do that? Because women do not do what they think. They do not say what they are feeling. They make sure that everybody else is okay before they are. You will take care of your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your uncles, your aunts, your neighbors, your employers, your employees, before you will take care of yourselves. Tonight, that is going to change. Tonight, my dream for all of you is that you start to give to yourselves as much as you give of yourselves. So do you have a goal here tonight? What is your goal? To be what? Secure. To be what? Strong. To be what? Smart. Those are the three S's coming from the one S on the stage that I would like all of you to do. So this is your evening. But, you know, I never plan a talk. So I really have no idea where to go from here. But I, that's when I always ask you a question. Why did you come? Why did you come here tonight? I want to hear it from you. Why did you come? Shout it out. Wait, 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 wait. That didn't go over very good, because I, I can't hear a damn thing that you're saying, right? right? Raise your hands, right? Raise your hands. Why did you come? Why did you come? Because I'm broke. Because she's broke. <laughs> Why did you come? Because of the mistakes I've made in the past. She came because of the mistakes she's made in the past, right? Why did you come? To learn more about retirement. A few more. You. Oh, she does not want her daughters to make the same mistakes as she did. Stand up, daughters. All right, daughters. Can you tell me the mistakes that your mother has made? 
Uh, I'm serious. D don't worry. Only a few million people are going to see this. <laughs> we don't know your mama's name. Yeah, if you duck down, maybe they won't recognize you, although the cameras are zoomed right in on you, girlfriend. <laughs> it's you, the whole world now. I want to hear from you the mistakes that you think your mother has made. Uh, I don't really know. Uh, <laughs> she likes Marshalls a lot. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Uh, she sent me to Catholic high school for one year, and then I transferred out, so that probably was a waste of money. Uh-huh. <laughs> I think just spending money that you don't have. So you feel that your mama spends money that she doesn't have? Not anymore. Not anymore, but, so she stopped yeah. that. But when you were little, you used to see that she did that. Um, Speak up and have a voice, woman. You've got to be a powerful <laughs> woman in life. Yeah. You cannot be a wimp. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. All right. I was just curious. Okay, you can sit down now. All right. Now, why did I do that? You can give them applause. So, why did I just do that? Because I didn't know what else to do. No. Because it's very important that all of you understand if the future is female, what you do is what your children see. They don't care what you say. They do not listen to what you say. They do what you do. And if it is our responsibility, which I believe that it is, to raise strong, smart, and secure children, especially little girls, then they need a role model. And they don't have role models at school. You can't ask a teacher who we undervalue and we pay absolutely no money to with the most important job in the world, teaching your children to be able to teach your children prosperity and being powerful when she or he themselves are totally coming from poverty. They don't have enough money to even buy all the materials for the classroom, and they themselves are powerless in most cases. It is impossible. So then who is going to teach your children to be like you want them to be? This woman does not want her children to be like she was. I find that very sad. And I find that sad because you need to be the role model for those kids. It's you that needs to say, I want my kids to do exactly what I do. I want my kids to be exactly like I am. I want all of you in this room to feel the power over their money that I feel. Because it's not just about having a lot of money. Having a lot of money doesn't mean that you're not going to get yourself in a situation where you're going to say no, but yet you say yes. It's having power over the money that you have. There's a lot of wealthy women out there who have been violated. A lot of wealthy women. And why did that happen to them? In my opinion, it's not just about having money. It's about having power over your money. So earlier tonight, the makeup artist arrives. She did pretty good, if you ask me. Right. <laughs> right. And I immediately start talking to her about her money. And she's like, no, I know about my money. I know where it is. I'm doing good with my money. I have no credit card debt. I have an eight-month emergency fund. I have a retirement account. What are you invested in? I don't know. Some mutual fund. Well, how do you know? You know? How did that get invested? Oh, I gave it to a financial advisor, and this woman is just doing it for me. That is not power, ladies. Yeah, you may be investing your money, but you need to know what you're investing your money in. You need to know what type of life insurance policies you have. You need to know. How long do you have left on your mortgage? What interest rate is your student loan? You need to know about your car loans. You need to know every single thing about your money. But you don't want to get involved in that. 
You only care about your household expenses. Have you noticed that? You're fine paying the bills, and you know why that is? Because your house holds your children. Your house holds everybody that you love. You don't care that you work 20, 40, 80, 100 hours a week. That money you don't care about. You don't care about Bill, Buck, and Penny. That was funny, and you didn't laugh. <laughs> I, don't know, I thought that was pretty funny. But you don't care about your financial children, do you? And you need to. So I started to tell you about the number one law of money. And the number one law of money is power attracts money and powerlessness repels it. Write it down. Why is that true? You heard me say that money right, will teach you more about yourself than anything else. Money is simply a physical manifestation of who you are. Listen to me closely now. You're the ones who go out and you earn a paycheck. You're the ones who get a paycheck and you decide are you going to save it? Are you going to spend it? Are you going to invest it? Money cannot do anything without you. Nothing. If I dropped a $20 bill right here, it could not say, Susie, pick me up. You know when you're walking in the streets and you see a dollar bill or you see 25 cents or whatever it is? Somebody lost that money. They didn't even know. Money is just lying there. It can't do anything. So people control money. You got that so far? If people control money, have you ever noticed in life that when you are powerful, everybody is attracted to you? Everybody wants to either hire you or be with you or go out with you or do whatever because people are attracted to power. People want to be around people that make them feel powerful when they feel so powerless. So they plug in to power. If people control money and power attracts people, do you understand how therefore power attracts money. Do you understand that connection? But now let's look at the other side of it, okay? You're powerless. Something's happened. You're in a relationship. You just broke up. You just gained the 20 pounds that you lost. Whatever it may be, when you are powerless, have you ever noticed that nobody wants to be around you? They just don't. You'll call them the first time your best friend, and you'll tell them what went on, and they'll listen to you. Call them again, they won't pick up. They'll never pick up, because they don't want to be around powerlessness. So if powerlessness repels people, and people control money, do you understand that when you are powerless, you repel people and you repel money. So what makes you the most powerless in life? Debt. Nothing makes you feel less than than when you have debt. Because when you have debt, you have bondage. And you will never have financial freedom if you're in bondage. You will never feel strong. You will never feel smart. And you will never feel secure. So here's the question that I have to ask for all of you right now. I want you to stand up and stay standing if you have credit card debt. Come on, Apollo. Stay standing. Good. Stay standing. 
I want you to stand if you have credit card debt, car loan debt, mortgage debt, 401k debt, stand. <laughs> Student loan debt. Oh, that's 100%. All right, almost great. Now I want you to turn the person next to you and I want you to tell them how much debt you have. I want you to sit down. Now, how did that feel? Horrible. They felt horrible. But want to know what's so great about it? Right? All of you, just maybe for the first time in your lives, you stood in your truth. You stood in your truth. Because we don't make a habit of telling people what we don't have. We make a habit of showing people who we are by the clothes we wear, by the cars we drive, by the jewelry that you have on. And yes, these are still my only pair of earrings. <laughs> right. I'll tell you a funny story, and I, it, I don't even know why I want to tell you this story. It was the last show that I was doing with Oprah. And I thought after 29 shows that if I wore a different pair of earrings that she or anybody would notice. And nobody did. <laughs> it was such a bummer, really, because anyway. But so you stood in your truth. Now in the same way, that it is important that we all have a voice and we all stick up for one another. We stick up for one another when another woman has either been violated or another woman, something has happened to her or whatever, and she doesn't have her own voice to be able to say something herself. It's up to us to speak for her and to help her and to be her companion that way and her hero. But in the same way, when you have debt, you have to have a financial voice where you are proud to say, I have $5,000 of credit card debt. I have $10,000 of credit card debt. Because the debt that you have does not define who you are. And so you can't be ashamed of it. And why? Because fear, shame, and anger are the three internal obstacles to wealth. Why don't you have wealth in your life? The question becomes right back to all of you. What are you doing to become an obstacle in your own path to financial freedom? And then you'll say to me, that's easy for you to say, Susie. You're standing on that stage, a seriously wealthy woman. And I so am. So am, but it wasn't always that way. So if you don't know my story, I'm compelled to tell you, because yesterday when I was at the Apollo, we were checking all the lights and everything, every person that was in here, I said, do you know my story? They go, no. Do you know my story? They go, no. I go, how can you not know my story? My story is fabulous. Fabulous, and what's so fabulous about it is this. I was born on the south side of Chicago. Mm -hmm. There you go, there you are. The real south side, the hood, 81st in Oglesby, right there where the shootings happen. There we go, right? And, and literally, my parents did not have money. My mother 
was a secretary and sold Avon. Thank God for Avon. Sold Avon. Oh, there we go. There we go. Avon, right? So, but really sold Avon on the side to pay the bills. My father had a very interesting story where he himself taught me a very interesting lesson. I was a teenager and I drive up to his little chicken shack. It was 400 square feet and I'm with my mom and I drive up and his building is totally on fire. And thank God he's standing outside and he's okay. And my mom says, oh my God, he's okay. Thank God, Susie, da, da, da. And then my father runs back into his little chicken shack because he remembers that every penny that he has to his name is in the cash register in this little chicken shack. And back then, the cash registers were metal. And out comes my father carrying this scalding metal box. He throws it down. And with that, he sustained third degree burns on his arms and his chest. That's when I learned, or I thought I had learned, that money was more important than life itself because I saw my father almost kill himself for the cash register. As time went on, I was never a good student. You know, I had a speech impediment. I couldn't pronounce my R's, S's, or T's. So words such as beautiful came out as boobital. Because I could not speak, I could not read, ladies and gentlemen. And because I could not read, in my school, which was horseman, they sat you according to your reading score. And I had the lowest reading score in the class. So I sat in the last row, last seat, while my friends all were in the first row, first seats. I knew I was stupid. I knew I was dumb. I knew I would never amount to anything. Here I go through the University of Illinois, never getting more than a grade of a C. Had to work my way through people. My parents did not have the money. Right? They had a lot of financial difficulties. And then I get into a Ford Econoline van that my brother gave me the money to buy, and I end up living on the streets for three months in Berkeley, California, until I landed my dream job as a waitress at the Buttercup Bakery. And that was 1973. And I was a waitress from 1973 till 1980, when I was then 29 years of age, all right? Now, all of you, I'm sure, are gonna be trying to figure out <laughs> how old does that make me? I am 67 as I stand up here in front of you. Mm. Now, I just have to say something. There's something radically wrong about when People applaud for you because you're 67 years of age. I don't know. I had this experience today where you know the look when you only have on your socks and your underpants, right? And you're looking in the mirror, and I looked in the mirror and I went, Mom! Right? You know that look? It's always quite astonishing to me when that happens. But so there I am almost 30 years of age, and I know, say to myself, I know I could be more than just a waitress, I can open my own restaurant. I call my mom and dad, ask for $20,000, they say, Susie, we don't have $20,000 to give you. To make a very long story short, all the customers that I have been waiting on for those seven years at the Buttercup Bakery where I was making $400 a month 
people for seven years, right? Gave me $50,000 to open up my own restaurant. They gave it to me with a note. It was $500 from one, $100, you know, 100 from another, 2000 None of these people had much money. And they gave me it with a note that said, this is for people like you to have your dreams come true, to be paid back with no interest in 10 years if you can. I said, all right, what do I do with this money? They told me to take it down to Merrill Lynch, a brokerage firm, and put it in a money market account. I didn't know what a Merrill Lynch was, and I didn't know what a money market account was. I went down, however, and I followed their instructions, and I was greeted by the broker of the day who gets all the new walk-ins. His name was Randy. And I told Randy what this money was for. I'm going to open up my own restaurant. And Randy says to me, how would you like to make a quick $100 a month or a week? or anything like that, Susie. I said, Randy, what do you think I can make a month? And he said, probably 500 to 1,000 a month. And I said, you can make me that much money that's more than I make working. And he said, sign here on the bottom line. He was a financial advisor working for a reputable brokerage firm, which it is still, by the way, to this day. It's the brokers that aren't always reputable. And Again, to make a long story short, he qualified me, he filled in the paperwork, made it look like I was a very wealthy woman, and within three months, because he qualified me to play the options market, all $50,000 was lost. Now, ladies, you just sighed. Because that happened to me, I stand on this stage in front of you today. You must always remember in life, every single no leads you closer to a yes. Every time you think you have sustained a loss, it is going to lead you to a gain. There is no way that anything doesn't always happen for the best. I believe from the bottom of my soul that God only knows how to give. He does not know how to take. So I thought, I know I can be a broker. They just make you broker. <laughs> so I got dressed in my red and white striped sassoon pants tucked into my white cowboy boots with a blue silk shirt on. And I went to interview for a job at Merrill Lynch. Can you imagine? I thought I looked hot. <laughs> now, before I go on with this story, there's somebody in the audience that experienced this that I'm looking at. Yes, Woody, I see you. Woody, stand up for just one second. Woody washed dishes with me at the Buttercup Bakery. And I just have to ask you this. Do you remember that outfit? Do you? I was a size six back then. Didn't I? It was hot, wasn't it? I walked in as the American flag. And before I knew it, I was in the manager's office, and he's looking at me, and he says the following, Susie, women belong barefoot and pregnant. Oh, yes, right? His name was Peter Sansevero. <laughs> I'm very aware that we're taping this for television. <laughs> it's one of my favorite things to do in life, is tell this story, right? And and he said, and just looked at me, and I like going, what? And all of a sudden I'm realizing, oh my God, there are no women working here in the Oakland office of Merrill Lynch. I'm gonna be the first woman that they've hired. They need to fill their affirmative action quota. Right? And I said to him, well, how much are you gonna pay me to make me pregnant? <laughs> and he said to me, $1,500 a month. He said, but 
I am going to fire you in six months. Didn't take me long to realize that 1,500 times six was $9,000. And that's what it would take me two years to make at the Buttercup Bakery. And I actually wanted to go back to the Buttercup Bakery because we had a good time there, didn't we? We loved the Buttercup Bakery. And so I said, fine. Now I'm working for Merrill Lynch. And again, to make a long story short, the operations manager who made sure that all the brokers stayed honest came up to me and told me that I need to see a lawyer because essentially what Randy the broker did was illegal because stockbrokers need to make sure that they invest your money according to your risk. So I got the attorney that he told me to get and I sued Merrill Lynch while I was working for them. Want to know what's so funny about that? Because I sued them, they couldn't fire me. <laughs> Don't you love that? I love that. And by the time the suit came to court, I was their number six producing broker. Peter went on to an actually higher job. I could tell you stories about Peter all day, people. All right, a higher job. And the new manager came in and said, this is crazy. Give Susie back the $50,000 plus 18% interest, which is what interest rates were back in 1981 and 82. Mm -hmm. And I was able to pay back all the people that gave me money. <laughs> I didn't tell you that to impress you, although you so should be. Right? I told you that to inspire you because there is not one of you in this room that has an excuse big enough to keep you from being more so that you can have more. Do you understand that? Because so many times you tell me, I can't do that. I don't have good grades. I can't do that. I come from poverty. I can't do that. I don't have the same opportunity. Oh, yes, you do. Yes, you do. If you go within, you will see why you are doing without. You will see that. So you have to stand in your truth. A lot of you said to me when we were asking, why did you come? And you said, debt retirement. I don't want to make mistakes anymore. And you heard me say that debt is bondage. You saw all of you stand. Wouldn't you like it one day if you were out of debt, if you felt that power? So without going into debt much more than that, here's what I want to say to you. If you have credit card debt, you are paying for your present day desires, but your costs are going to be your future day needs, people. When you get older, you're going to need money to take care of yourself. You're going to need money to buy medicine. You're going to need money. You don't need the things that you are spending your money on now. So how do you get out of credit card debt? It's by these three rules. Number one, you are to live below your means, but within your needs. I'll never forget when I first moved to New York, and it was after a book I had written called Nine Steps to Financial Freedom hit the big time. And I had money. And I could have afforded to buy a million dollar apartment, a two, three million dollar apartment on park and da 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 da, but I didn't need it. Instead, I bought a 700 or 800 square foot apartment on 57th Street that was like, even though it was expensive for everywhere else, for New York it was not. It was $240,000 at the time. And that's what I bought. And it was right on 57th Street next to Mr. Chow's. And I loved that apartment. 
I could afford more, but I didn't need it. So I was living below my means, but within my needs. So here's the question you all have to ask yourself. When do you buy what you need versus what you can afford when you can afford more than what you need? I could afford a more expensive apartment, but I did not need it. Got that? If you live your life with that one rule, your life will start to change. How do you start to live that rule? From this day forward, I would like you to make a vow to yourself that for the next six months, I would like you to only buy needs, not wants. What's a need? Need is food at a grocery store. What is a want? Want is food at a restaurant. Oh, so bad for New York, right? What the hell are you going to do on weekends? What are you going to do for lunch? Oh, my God. All right, if you can't try it for six months, since I knew you were going to have that reaction, can you try for 21 days? Because Dr. Oz says, if you do something for 21 days, you will break your habits. Just can you try it? And the third thing is, can you get as much pleasure out of saving as you do spending? Can you just try that? Can you see what it feels like to put $100 a month away or $200 and everything like that? And let me tell you why that is so important. Time is the most important ingredient in any financial freedom recipe. You are 25 years of age. We have any 25-year-olds out there, my little daughters? I had a feeling, a few. You're 25 years of age, and you put $100 a month right here and right now into a Roth IRA. And if you don't know what one is, I'll explain it in a little bit to you. And you invest that $100 every month into a Standard & Poor's 500 index fund, which I'll also explain to you. And you do that every single month until you are 65 years of age. And over those 40 years, the money Sometimes the years you make 30%, sometimes you lose 20%, but over all those years, you average an annual percentage of 12%. Now, that is a little high. It could be 10 or 11, but I'm going to use 12 to make an example here because it is possible. Do you know that by the time you were 65, you would have $1 million at $100 a month? You could be a millionaire. Do you ever think you could be a millionaire? But you're young, and you think, what difference does $100 a month make? It's $1,200 a year. In 10 years, that is $12,000. What difference does $12,000 make? If you start at 35 rather than 25, at 65, you would have what? $300,000. Dollars. Those 10 years cost you $700,000, girlfriend, right? I'm talking to you, right? Because you're going, I can see it. That much, $700,000? $700,000, and that's at $100 a month. What if it were $200 a month or $300 a month? That's called compounding, where you put money in, your money makes money, the money that your money makes makes money, the money that your money makes that your money makes that your money makes makes money, and before you know it, you are multi-millionaires. So maybe we could change your habits here that you could get more pleasure out of saving, knowing that every time you put that $100 in, every time you do something, you're on the path to becoming a millionaire. Do you think you could try that? 
Somebody over here wanted to know about retirement. And I recently just said, a few seconds ago, the best place to put that money would be a Roth IRA. Let's talk about retirement plans for a second here. A lot of you say to me, Susie, I cannot save for my retirement. I can barely, barely pay my bills now. So here's the question to all of you. If you can barely pay your bills today while you have a paycheck coming in, can you tell me how you are going to pay those exact same bills when you no longer have a paycheck coming in? How are you going to do that? You're not going to be able to. And if you think that you're going to be able to count on the government to save you, are you kidding me? You think they care about you? Really? Really? They can't care about you because, in my opinion, they have so much debt that they are creating $21 trillion to just keep this country running. They don't have the money to keep your lives running for you, so you're going to have to do it yourselves. And how do you do that? You start right here and right now. So out of all the retirement accounts that are out there that you can have, what should you be doing? If you work for a corporation that offers you a 401k plan that matches your contribution, I don't care if you don't have a pot to pee in, you have got to contribute to your 401k plan up to the point of that match. What kind of 401k plan should you all be invested in? It should be a Roth 401k if your company offers it. If your company does not offer it, you should walk yourselves into your HR department or whoever deals with that for your company, and you should demand that they carry a Roth 401k, a Roth 403b, or a Roth TSP if you're in the military or a teacher. You should demand that you have a Roth. Why? A Roth account is an account that is in a retirement account where you invest with money that you have already paid taxes on. Because you have already paid taxes on that money, while the money is in that account, it will grow, it will earn for you, and later on in life when you go to take it out, you will take it out 100% tax free. You die, and it goes to your children. They get to take it out 100% tax free. All of you think, oh, I need to invest in a retirement account today and get a tax write-off for that money because I don't want to pay as much in taxes, so I'm going to do a traditional 401k or a traditional IRA. Big, big mistake. And the reason that this is a mistake is there is another lot of money. And it is called invest in the known versus the unknown. What do you know right now? You know what tax bracket you are in. And truthfully, all of us are in the lowest tax brackets of history at this point in time. Do you know that not that many years ago, tax brackets were at 90%, then 70%, in, then 50%, in the, when I first started, tax brackets were 50%. So when you're paying what you are paying right now, relatively speaking, even though it may seem high, it is low. What is unknown? Unknown is what tax brackets are going to be 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years from now when you need to withdraw this money. Wouldn't you rather just pay the taxes right now now it's out of the way. And now you have all of this money in an account. So what you see is what you get. If you get older and you see that there's $500,000 or a million dollars in a retirement account, if you needed to take out 
a million dollars in a Roth 401k, you could take a million dollars out, no taxes. You take a million dollars out from a traditional 401k, you're going to lose at least 50% of that to taxes. So what you see in a traditional 401k is not what you get. Do all of you understand that? Next, this is your opportunity to stand with me in your truths and ask questions. So if you have questions about anything that I am talking about, you need to raise your hands and you need to ask it. A woman should not have to keep quiet to ask a question or to say anything that she wants to say. When she wants to say something, she needs to stand up and say it. Do you hear me? Oh, we have questions. I need mics. Let's get them to these women. All right. Yes, ma'am. Stand up and say your name. Hi, Susie. My name is Jessica Ortiz. I'm from Washington, D.C. And I'd love to know your thoughts on life insurance, retirement plan, LERPs. All right. So first, what I want you to do, I want questions right now on retirement accounts, if that's all right. Because And then I'll get to life insurance. I promise you. Who has questions on what I just said about retirement accounts? Stand up. Yes. Hi, Susie. Delina here. Um, is there a salary limit um, to qualify for a Roth IRA? So you have a Roth. So good question, because there is. You have, but I'm going to tell you how to get around it. <laughs> Legally. When you have a Roth 401k, obviously that's with your employer, but besides a Roth 401k or a 401k, you can also have an IRA or a Roth IRA. You can have both, just so you know. If you have an employer that matches your contributions, I personally would be contributing to my Roth 401k up to the point of the match with my employer and if I was struggling for money, but I still wanted to invest a little more, I would not invest more in the Roth 401k with my employer. I would open up a Roth IRA. Why? Out of all the retirement accounts that are out there, bar none, I am in love with a Roth IRA. <laughs> I would marry it if I could. Seriously, here is the reason why. Within a Roth IRA, and it is the only account that this is true for when it comes to a retirement account, when you put money in, any money that you put in, your original contributions, you can take out at any time without taxes or penalties, regardless of your age, or how long that money has been in there. Got that? You are 38 years of age, and you put $5,000 this year into a Roth IRA, $5,000 next year, $5,000 the year after. You have $15,000 in there, and it's grown to $16,000. Now your car breaks down. You need a new air conditioner. Something happens. You can take out any amount of money that you want up to that $15,000 that you originally put in without taxes or penalties, ladies. It's the $1,000 that it earned that has to stay in there till you're at least 59 and a half, and the account has to be open for at least five years to take that out. Got that? Do you understand why I love that? Because all of you don't want to put money into a retirement account because you're afraid you're going to need money. And you're afraid that if you need money, you're not going to be able to get that money without penalty. So you don't do it at all. Now you can put it into a retirement account and get your original contributions any time you want. That is a big deal. But because it's such a big deal, there are qualifications on income because not everybody qualifies for it. So who qualifies? If you are an individual and not married, right, you can put in your full contribution of your 5,000, your 5,500. It just will depend as the years change here, right? If you make under $120,000 a year of adjusted gross income. 
Once you make $135,000 a year of adjusted gross income, you no longer legally qualify for a Roth. If you are married, finally, jointly, it's $189,000 to $199,000. And after $199,000, you no longer qualify. However, if you want to get money into a Roth and you make more than that, all you have to do is to put money into a non-deductible IRA and convert it to a Roth. So a non-deductible IRA is an IRA that you do not take the deduction for it when you put it in, and then you can convert any amount of money into a Roth, because there are no income limitations to do that. Make sure you check with your CPA before you do that, because if you have other retirement accounts, it may affect if you can do that or not. If you're self-employed, you can put money into a SEP IRA, a lot of money, and convert that into a Roth. That is another way. Any more questions on whatever? All right, who has a mic? A few more. Just to clarify, you had mentioned $100 a month into a Roth IRA and then $100 a month into a standard and poor index fund. When yes. it comes to retirement, would the Roth be more beneficial in the long run? Fabulous question, because these are the type of questions you need to be able to ask. A Roth IRA is a retirement house that holds your money. Within that house, you buy investments. So you put the $100 into the house. And once it's in the house, now you're going to buy some furniture for that house. And the furniture that you're going to buy for that house is a Standard & Poor's 500 index fund. You can either buy an exchange-traded fund with the initials SPY, which is a spider, or a regular mutual fund that's a Standard & Poor's 500 fund. Now, a lot of you are looking at me and you're going, I don't know anything of this terminology. I don't get it. I'm just going to say this to you now. When you all leave tonight, you will be getting another bag. And in that bag, you will have a copy of my new book called Women and Money. And, and it's in that book that you will find a financial empowerment plan that will tell you, do this, do this, do this. I will take your hand all the way through buying a car, buying a house, doing a will, doing a trust, everything that you need to do in the chapter called Financial Empowerment Plan. In there, I also explain to you what an index fund is, an exchange-traded fund is. I tell you all of that. Now, if that's not enough for you, just be, uh, before I go on here, I have a course. And the course is a fabulous course. It is online. It has seven different sections to it. And it does sell for $54. But you're not going to spend $54. Because if you go to suzyu.com, all right, and you enter the gift code WOMEN, you will be able to take that course for free. And it's in that course that you see videos and there's tests and there's all kinds of things that you can interact with right there to teach you about money. Because I have to tell you, I want to be your teacher. I want to be the one that all of you come to to get your financial information. Because I don't have anything to sell you, but I sure have a whole lot to give you. I have over 35 years now of financial information, working with people's money, knowing your emotions, understanding you. I doubt very highly that there is another finance person in this entire world that has talked to more people than I have over the past 14 years. So my job isn't to get you to buy something. My job is to 
educate you. It's to educate you so that you can have financial freedom. You can have power. And I can stop getting emails that break my heart because there comes a time in life, ladies, when it is too late. I used to stand on this stage and I would say, never too soon to begin, it's never too late to start. That is not true. There comes a time when it is too late. So you should share that code with as many people as you want. You should put it on the internet. You should put it every social media place that you have. You should spread it far and wide so that those that aren't here today can also participate. And after you have read your book, and I know you're going to love that book, share it with another woman, lift up another woman, help educate another woman, and make this world a better place. Hi, Susie, I have a question. My employer offers both. They offer the traditional 401k as well as the Roth 401k, and I also participate in the Roth. Right now, I'm just participating in the traditional 401k, and I'm scheduled in a couple of years to max out, at which time I was going to take that additional 6% and contribute to the Roth 401k. No, nope. I have two years to wait. Okay. I want you to do it right away. My concern is to my uh, take home pay. That's my concern. If I make the switch too early, I'm concerned that I'm going to take, I'm, I'm going to put myself in a financial bind as it pertains to my take home pay. All right. So let me tell you why you won't. I learned a long time ago right, that Whatever you make and you bring home, you spend. I don't want you to make less, but the less you bring home, the less you will spend. So I will make a bet with you, $100, right here on this stage, right? That, but really, I promise you that if you start switching to the Roth and you bring home less money, you will spend less money. And you will find that it works. The good news is, if it doesn't, go back and switch. But wouldn't it be great if that happened? So the more money you make, the more money you spend. The less money you think you make, the less money you spend. Will you give it a try for me? Yes, ma'am. You got it. But really, everybody, haven't you noticed that's true? Like Woody. Remember, we were making $400 a month, $5,000 a year, and we used to say, or at least I used to say, if I only could make $10,000 a year, I'd be sitting pretty. <laughs> oh my God. If I only made $30,000 a year, it would be great. Oh, if I only made $80,000, $150,000, $250,000, half a million, now a million. It never was enough. And it was never enough because as I was making more money, I wanted everybody to see how much more money I was making. I wanted to impress people that much more. And till I got smacked big time in the face, that's a whole nother story. But do you understand? Your money will never define you. You define your money. It's so fascinating that sometimes when I wear clothes or whatever, and it could be a $10 jacket, or just last week I was on this, um, oh, it was on the Gail King Show on CBS the other morning, and I had this jacket on, this red jacket and my belt and my black, you know, little t-shirt that I always wear. Rachel Mad Maddow copies. <laughs> right. If you look back on any single show I ever did for over 14 years, you will see the same little black t-shirts here, right? She has the same thing, maybe a longer neck, but that's different, right? <laughs> like, but I love Rachel, I have to tell you. I just love that woman. But here's the thing, all right? What was I saying? <laughs> Where was I going with that? The jacket. Oh, the red jacket, right. So. The segment's over, and then they say, I love that jacket. And like, expensive, right? And I said, no, it was 
five dollars at the which is true at the HSN store that I happened to be visiting the week before five dollars and they just looked at me and they said it's not good to lie <laughs> I'm like I'm not lying but because I was wearing it because I was wearing it right it was whatever so I got a little email saying really is that what the, uh, anyway so but do you all understand what I'm saying you make your clothes you make the impression and the clothes can never make you look that powerful it's if you're wearing something and your clothes are leased to the department store that you purchase them from are you kidding me you really think you're gonna exude power and I hope none of you went out and bought an outfit to wear here tonight because you thought you were going to be on television. Anybody else have a question about retirement? I'm going to move on. Whoever the mic goes to, yes. Well, my name is Mary Sherwin. I just wanted to follow up on the difference between the two 401k plans. Yes. If you're contributing already to a 401k plan. A traditional pre one. Yes, a traditional one. What can you do about all of the money that you've already put into the traditional one? So you can, depending on your tax bracket, you can very slowly start to transfer it from the traditional to the Roth. However, that would depend on how many years you still have left before you want to retire. If you're 20 or 30 years of age and you still have another 30 or 40 years, that makes sense to do it. If you are older and you are going to retire in the next two, three, four years, that would not make any sense. So then you would leave the money that you have in the traditional 401k alone and your new contributions would go into the Roth 401k. Except for whatever's matched by your employer. Which yes, you, what, when your employer matches your contribution, you put money into your Roth 401k, their contribution will go into your traditional 401k. That's it. All right, let's move on. I have right. a question. Who has oh a question? I love that you just did that when I was ready to move on. <laughs> Good for you, girlfriend. <laughs> Um, my question, I don't know if many people can relate, but I used to be an artist and I got tired of being broke, so now I work in corporate America. So what if you have a retirement fund, I max it out every time, get the 100% match, but I don't plan to actually retire. I plan to eventually, I don't know when this is airing, but hopefully soon leave my job, cash out, and start my own business. Um, would you advise against cashing out early or what would you have as a plan for something like that? <laughs> I didn't just hear that right, did I? You plan to cash out your retirement plan? Yes. Your 401k. How old are you? I just turned 30. You just turned 30. <laughs> That's why I'm here tonight, okay? <laughs> Listen to me closely. How much do you have in your 401k? About 65,000. All right. You have 65,000. And just out of curiosity, when you withdraw the 65,000, how much of that 65,000 do you think you're going to have left? 30? If you're lucky. Because the first thing you're going to have to do is pay a 10% federal tax. That's $6,500. Now you're going to have to pay a penalty tax to... Who? New York. Then you're going to be taxed on all of it. So maybe you're going to have 30, 20. You really want to. When I just stood up on this stage <laughs> and I said what happened about compounding. Did you hear me talk about compounding? And did you hear me tell you how $100 can grow over 45 years to a million? And you're talking about wasting $30,000 to do what with? To do what with? You are not going to do that. If, if, you want, if you want to be an artist, then you have to be a powerful artist. And you will not be a powerful artist when you don't have any money. 
Well, I have 20,000 in stocks. I just don't want to touch that. Girlfriend, why in the world do you not want to touch your stock money that there's no penalty on, but you want to touch your retirement money? You think you're never going to get old like me? <laughs> that really makes no sense. You leave your retirement money as it is. You will do an IRA rollover into a good discount brokerage firm, and you will start to invest that money. You will read Women and Money. You will do everything that I tell you to do in there. Thank you. Right? However, you have $20,000 in stock that you can touch. Maybe it's appreciated in value. Maybe you've held it for more than a year. So if you did cash out, all you would pay is capital gains. If you were going to do this, listen closely to me now. Wait to cash out that money if you have a gain in it. And hopefully you do, given what's happened in the stock market. And if you don't, something's wrong there as well, right? <laughs> and wait until next year when you no longer have any income coming in and you're in a really low income tax bracket. Oh, I'm not just another pretty face, am I? Mm -hmm. Am I making sense why I want her to do that? So if you do have a capital gain here or even really ordinary income over here because you didn't hold it for a year, it's not going to be that big of a deal for you if you need that money to fulfill your dream. If that's what you want to do, then you can go ahead and do that. Got that? Yes, thank you. Now, now why am I letting her do that? Because there comes a point in everybody's life that they have to go for it. And they have to do what they're passionate about. Right? You remember when I said that my dad taught me the lesson that money was more important than life itself? That's not true. Life is more important than money. Life is more important than money but it's the quality of the life that you live. Lack of money can make people do really, really crazy things. All right? Now, I will be the first to tell all of you, money alone will never make you happy. But I also will be the first to tell you, lack of money sure will make you miserable. <laughs> Got that? So again, the goal isn't just to have money. The goal is also for you to have power over your money, which is why I wrote the book, Women and Money. If you want to find the best financial advisor in the world, look in the mirror, because nobody cares about your money more than you do. And what happens to your money directly affects the quality of your life. Not my life, not your financial advisor's life, but your life. And money is not that difficult. Did I not stand here and did I not tell you that I was dyslexic, that I couldn't read, that I could not speak, that I was a waitress, that I didn't have an education, that I came from a family without money? And look at me now. What makes you different than me. What? Nothing except your own thoughts. Next law of money. Your thoughts create your reality. It is said to be very, very careful about what you think, because what you think you will eventually say. Be very careful about the words that you use, because what you say you eventually do. Your actions become your habits, and your habits become your destiny. If you think you can't, ladies, you never, ever will. You have got to speak words of power. You have to have thoughts of power. You have to have belief in yourself, and you have got to stay away from other women that drag you down or other men that drag you down. You have got to keep good company. 
I'll never forget, I had just finished writing the nine steps to financial freedom. And I was at a house with my friend and da 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 da, and it was Christmas and everybody was to make a wish. And I said, I wish that Nine Steps to Financial Freedom becomes the best selling book in the United States, nonfiction. And everybody laughed at me. They laughed at me and they said, that's impossible, Susie. Why don't you wish for something that you're going to get? Guess what? I got it. In 1998, The Nine Steps to Financial Freedom, according to Publishers Weekly, was the number one selling nonfiction book of all nonfiction hardback books in the United States. Okay. So you have to be around people that say, you can do that. You can try that. Girlfriend, you want to be an artist? Be a best artist that this world has ever seen. Do not let yourself down. Do not let any excuses get in your way. Do not let yourself fail because it is your life and it only matters to you. So you draw a picture of extraordinary wealth, extraordinary happiness, extraordinary faith that God has you in his hands. So let him draw for you, girlfriend. Let me talk briefly about life insurance because somebody had a question about life insurance. Doesn't it feel good not to be forgotten? <laughs> Doesn't it? Stand up and tell me what your question was. Hi, Susie. Thanks for remembering my question. Um, I'm trying to build a passive income stream. I didn't remember your question. I remembered you. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, no, wait. Wait. I remembered you. Why did I remember you? I'm in the front row. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Okay, go on. Um, I'm no, wait, to... wait, seriously. Right. Wait a minute, right? I remembered you because something about you made an impression upon me. All right? I don't need to know what it was but it was a sense of power, it was a sense of you needing to know something, and I came back to you. Never forget the power that you have to draw somebody to you. Don't forget that, all right? All right, go on. Um, she can't remember her question now. <laughs> <laughs> that, no, that's incredible. You're actually on my vision board at home, so this is... This is well, me. here I am right now. <laughs> Here I am right now. Yeah. Now, did she draw me here or did I draw you here? Both. I think it was you who drew me here. I have to tell you, this is the truth. Wait, and then I'll get to your damn question. <laughs> which is many people said, because I'm only giving one talk on this, and that's it throughout the United States, and that's it, right? And it's here. And, and there are many people whose names you would know, so therefore I won't mention them, that said, you don't want to play the Apollo. You don't need to play the Apollo, Susie. Play Midtown, play another stay, play whatever. And I was like, no, I had a dream for some reason. I've had this dream to play the Apollo. And I bet it happened the day that you put me on your vision board. <laughs> so we all need to thank this woman right here. All right, girlfriend, now ask your question. Susie, I want to retire as soon as possible. Why? <laughs> Why do you want to retire? How old are you? I'm 29. <laughs> but are you part of this fire movement that Adam from Money Magazine, who's right back there, was telling me about yesterday that I'm like, you're kidding me, right? Uh, is that what the, what you, uh, go on. 
And so I want to build a passive income stream and I've been doing it through rental real estate, but it's not happening fast enough. And so I wanted to know your thoughts on LERPs, um, the life insurance retirement plans. Listen, it doesn't matter what investment we're talking about right now. You, I don't know how many millions of dollars do you have. Do you have millions and millions? Do you not have yet. A, do you have at least one million? Depends on how you count it. Right. Well, how about if we take away all the mortgages and all the debt and everything, do you have like 500,000? Uh, like uh, do you three. have like 200,000? Yeah. <laughs> Girlfriend, you can't afford, you are denied. Please listen to me and listen to me closely, all right? The average life expectancy now is into the 80s and 90s. My mother died at 97. Women live longer than men. That is because we are killing them off. <laughs> My daddy died at 71, right? But it's true. Women live longer than men. Therefore, your money has got to last you, not from 29 to 39 to 49 to 59 to 69 to 79 to 89, but to 99. And there is no way, no investment, no matter the life insurance, real estate, anything, is going to get you to 99 if you don't have another source of income building in to build up that money. At 29, you should not be thinking about you want to retire. You know what you should be thinking about? That I love what I do so much that I never want to give this up. And why do we hate what we do? Because we have our personal life, and we have our professional life. Wrong. You need one life. Your professional life is your personal life, and your personal life, in my opinion, is your professional life. And you should be happy doing both of them because it is your life. And if you don't like living one part of your life, change it. Change it. And the time that you can change it is when you are younger, is when you can make mistakes, is when you can say, okay, if you have a quarter million dollars at the age of 29, you can change what it is that you are doing. I love what I do. Do you think I do this to make money anymore? No. You know how it makes me so mad when people say, how much money is enough money? How much money does somebody need? Did it ever occur to any of you it's never about the money anymore? It's about doing what you love. Can you see it in me? I love this. I love this. And I'm lucky enough that what I love makes me money. But half the time that I do something, I don't make any money. And why would I do that? Because I do love you. And I do care about you. Right? But with that said, I also want to say one other thing. Every woman needs a woman who cares about them. Right? And I will forever believe behind every great woman is an even greater woman. And when you get the book, you will see that I have dedicated that book to a woman by the name of Esther Margolis. And back in 1994, I wrote a book, or wanted to write a book, working title called Keeping Your Gold in the Golden Years, and I simply wanted to do it to impress my clients. I had my own brokerage firm at the time, and I just wanted to do that. And I showed that book 
to Simon & Schuster, to Random House, to Penguin, to every single HarperCollins publisher out there. And it was like, no, no, no. Who needs a finance book written by a woman in 1994? Except one publisher. One publisher that said, come and see me when you're in New York. And I sat down with Esther and I started to tell her my story. And in a few minutes, Esther said, stop. And she had her entire office come in to her office and said, start again, tell them your story. Before you knew it, I had a $10,000 book advance and she was gonna give me 50 copies of a book that she named, You've Earned It, Don't Lose It. And I'm like, are you kidding me? You're gonna pay me $10,000 to write a book for me to give my clients? This is a great thing. And then she told me I had to go on a book tour. And the first print run of that book was, I believe, 15,000 copies. And that meant that all the bookstores had two copies, three copies, no copies. And Esther <laughs> sent me on a 25, 26, 20, a lot city book tour <laughs> that she had to pay for. And I went, and nobody showed up. Oh, no, no, stop with that. Every of those things I go, did I just, what is wrong with you women? <laughs> right? And I was scared, and I didn't know what to do, and Esther was the one who got me originally on QVC, and she would go with me, and she would hold my hand. And because of Esther Margolis's courage to see what I couldn't see in myself and no other publishers could see in me, millions and millions and millions of women's lives have been changed. Esther, can you please stand up? What's fascinating, everybody, is I myself am getting older at the age of 67, knowing that shortly I'm going to be 70 and so on. And you realize that, you know, you're getting older and the young ones are coming up and they'll replace you. And one day, will you be forgotten? Will you not? We can't forget our matriarchs. We can't forget the women that set the bar. So the question is, who is your Esther in your life? Mm. Who is your Esther in your life? Because all of us have an Esther. And who do you want to be an Esther for? Right? Mama, you want to be an Esther for your children. And girls, you want to be an Esther for your children or your friends or people you don't even know. And so again, Esther, from the bottom of my heart, you know, as I look out on the audience today, I see quite a few people. I see Julie Grau, who is my publisher of all my books, including this one, and Susan Cochran and Michelle, who are the publicist, and Nancy Friend, and Sandy Mendelson, who was my very first publicist, and all these people. And I'm just curious where Judy Jacqueline is. Where is she? Judy, stand up. Judy Jacqueline Belushi was John Belushi's wife. Stay standing, Jutes. And was my college roommate. John, right? John, Judy, and I shared a bedroom, right? And we had one hell of an animal house, didn't we, girlfriend? We did. And for anybody else that's out there that's really just been a part of my life, I just really want to thank you. And one last woman, which is Sarah Puel. I don't know if you've been listening to the Women in Money podcast. They'll be coming up again. We did a series of 13. But Sarah is my co-host 
on it and just fabulous. All right. Now, where should we go from here? What else do you need to know about? What was it? Buying a house. Buying a house. Let's talk about that, all right? Listen, I'll get you. I'm not going anywhere. Listen, I'll stay here as long as you want, right? But, but we said it was going to be a two-hour show. Susie? So, yes. Question here? Where are you? Back here? Way back, in the back. Gotcha. Yep. All right, yes. Susie O, oh, such a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. Um, as an entrepreneur, I actually have money now. And when I started the business, I would listen to you, but I had no money to do anything with. So since the last 10 years, my business has grown and I've been completely blessed. So everything you talk about, about loving what you do, every single day, I get to do what I love. It doesn't feel like work. And now sitting, I have a small nest egg just sitting in cash. Yes. And my concern is that I finally have something to show for my effort and my perseverance over the years, and I'm just afraid it's going to sit there. Yeah. And so what is your thought about now that you have some money, what do you do with it as an entrepreneur? Do you have any credit card debt at all? No. Do you own a home? No. Do you want to own a home? No. No. Do you... <laughs> Great. Right. Do you have any debt on any level? No. No. Do you have at least an eight-month emergency fund? One year. One year. Do you have, besides that one year of an emergency fund, now do you have money that you can invest? Yes, ma'am. With your own company that you have owned, do you have a SEP IRA or a KEO plan? Do you have retirement accounts? Yes, ma'am. And do you max them out? I do, but after what you're saying today, I'm a little confused because I'm in a traditional account a traditional and IRA, a traditional 401k, what are you in? Traditional IRA and a SEP. And right. my accountant had said, be in traditional because you can take it as a tax write-off. Of course they did. So right. do I transition that into an IRA Roth and forget the tax write-off? If you qualify, yes. So did you, I, yeah, that's what I said earlier. All right. Remember that law, invest in the known versus the unknown? Remember that part yes. of the talk? Okay, yes. good. Um, so, no, but very seriously. I don't care about tax write-offs today. I don't care about them. What I care about is later on in the future, what you see in your accounts is what you're going to get. Just what if to deal with the deficits that we have right now, tax brackets started to go up and up and up. Is that possible, especially after 10 years, when their 10 years of this tax cut goes away? Is that possible that we're going to be slapped with some of the biggest tax brackets of our life? I don't know, but it is possible. What I do know is if I invest and pay the taxes today, then I get to have 100% of that money and all of its growth anytime I want. So that later on in life, all of a sudden you go, oh, you know what? I do want to own a home. I have $2 million in there. I'll take out a million dollars and just buy a home for cash. You couldn't do that with the traditional. And if you have children or any other beneficiaries, when you leave them money via a traditional 401k or a traditional IRA, they now have only a few years to get that money out, and they are taxed at their tax brackets. Oh, they won't take it over a few years. They'll take it right away. They'll be like this one, or that one, wherever she was over there, right? Gone, and they'll lose half of it to income tax. So yes, start doing your SEP IRA, you can convert to your Roth IRAs. However, be careful, because that will now add to your tax bracket. So you'll have to figure that out with this CPA that's advising you. And maybe you want a different one? I'm not I do, sure. I do, yes. Oh, how did I have that feeling? Yeah. Is and it a man that's... or a woman? A man. Oh, how did I have that feeling? <laughs> no, really. I, and let me just tell you this very brief story. So I went to see some uh, CPA that was recommended by everybody, my agent, my this, my that, and I go see him. And I tell him I'm going to buy now an investment, a house and everything for $800,000, and I wanted to pay cash for it. And he said, why would you pay cash for it when you can get a write-off and everything? I said, because I don't want debt. I want to be powerful, and in my mind, 
debt is bondage, and bondage is not good. And he said, that makes absolutely no sense, financially speaking. I said, did you ever think about that there's another side to finances, and it's called personal empowerment? What makes you feel, what's the goal of money? To be secure. What makes you feel secure? Nothing makes a woman feel more secure than owning her own home outright. Right? So I got up, and I walked out, and I left. Only use advisors that resonate within your soul. If you have a gut feeling that that's not the right person for you, do not worry about hurting their feelings, okay? You get up and you leave. So check with the CPA first and find out, but start getting your money now into Roth IRA situations for yourself. And congratulations. All right. Thank you. Thank Let you. me see. All right. A few more. You wanted me to talk about real estate. Let me just go there for a second. We're in New York, people. Does it really make sense to own property in New York at this point in time? I don't think so. And I don't think so. Buying a home for your own, right? Forget about investment property. That's a whole nother thing that whatever, right? <laughs> but it's unless you have a lot of money and you can put 20% down or minimum 10% and you can afford the mortgage rates and the, and the property taxes and the condo or the co-op fees and all of those things, all right, if you want to. But I see a situation where interest rates are starting to go up. I see a situation where things can start to change in the next year or two within this economy, especially in May 2000 and, or November 2020. I think we have to be careful financially speaking, all right? So I personally would not be buying right now. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't. Maybe you have a good buy, maybe it's what you do, but it's not something that I would probably do right here and right now. Is there a time that I could, would do it? Maybe. But as interest rates are going up, mortgages are becoming more expensive. As mortgages become more expensive, houses tend to start to go down. As, so it's not something that I love as an investment right here. However, for those of you who do own a home and you want to stay in that home for the rest of your lives, you need to make it your number one priority to have the mortgage on that home paid off by the time you retire at 30 years of age. <laughs> okay, why? Listen to me closely. Interest rates right now are getting higher. Let's say you don't have the best credit score and now if you're gonna get a mortgage, just let's say it's at 6%. Let's just say that's true. And let's say somehow you're able to find a home for $200,000. I get it, but just, just stick with me here for a second. $200,000, 30-year mortgage is $1,200 a month, is $14,400 a year. Do you know after 20 years of pain, $1,200 a month on a $200,000 mortgage, do you know that you would still owe $100,000 on that mortgage. In 20 years, you only paid down 50%, but you still, you still have to pay $14,400 a year for that mortgage. How much do you need in a retirement account, especially if it is a traditional retirement account, in order to pay $14,400 a year on that mortgage? You would need about four to five hundred thousand dollars in a retirement account at four or five percent to able to take money out after taxes so you would have fourteen thousand four hundred dollars a year to pay your mortgage. Don't you think it's just easier to pay off a hundred thousand dollar mortgage than it is to save four or five hundred thousand dollars to pay that mortgage? And everybody says, but I won't get a tax write-off anymore. 
you got your tax write-off in the first years that you had the mortgage. The banks want to get all their interest up front in the first seven years because they know it is possible you might sell that home in seven years. So they want the interest on the 30 years up front on, in the seven years so that later on you don't get a tax write-off anymore, but they got all of their interest. Do you get that, people? So don't worry about the tax write-offs later on because they do not matter. You understand that? Right? And it doesn't matter if you buy a home or not. It really doesn't. You can invest money, you can save money, you can do anything that you want. Real estate is an illiquid investment. You can't just make a call and say, sell, buy. You have to put it on the market. You have to buy new air conditioners. You have to deal with natural disasters. You have to deal if it's an investment with your tenants not paying you and on and on. So just think about that. Stock market, I just want to say this. All of you, because I heard you kind of, uh, when I said just November 2020. Listen, this market's been going up for quite a while, straight up, all right? And don't you all wish that you had stayed in the stock market or bought everything in the year 2008 when everything had gone down, <laughs> all right? You should all, if you have 20, 30, 40 years till you need your money, you should be wishing and a praying and a hoping that the stock market goes down. Goes down. Why? Same way you wait to close, go on sale, and that's when you go to buy it. When the market goes down, you're going to start using a technique called dollar cost averaging. This is how all of you are going to start investing. You are not going to take a lump sum of money and put it all in the stock market today. So you back there have a lump sum of money that you can invest. That is not how you are going to invest. You are going to take that money and maybe let's say it's $12,000 and you're going to divide it by 12. And you're going to take $1,000 a month or whatever amount it is. I don't care if it's $50. I don't care if it's $100. But you're going to take that amount of money every single month and you're going to invest that in to the Standard & Poor's 500 Index Fund if you don't know anything else to do with it. When the market goes down, the shares of the Standard & Poor's 500 Index Fund, which is simply a fund that has all the stocks in it, what you're going to do is you are going to take your money, and when the market goes down, the shares of the Standard & Poor's 500 Index Fund will go down. Your dollars buy more shares, right? At $10, if you're putting in 100 bucks, you buy 10 shares. At $5, you buy 20 shares. When the market goes up, your dollars buy less shares. Are you following me? But over time, you have averaged the cost of your dollars in all that you have purchased, and you will come out further ahead. And so if you just did that month in and month out, hoping that this market goes down and down and down and not stopping to invest when the market goes down, not stopping to invest when the market goes up, and just stick with that oh, year over year over year. I promise you, you will be very happy, healthy, and wealthy women. So don't get upset if the markets go down. Keep your sanity about you. I have a few more minutes, so a few more questions. So what is down in the stock market? The stock market can go down 10%, 20%. It can go down a lot. You know, it can go down 50%. It can go down 70%. I don't care what it does go down. Nobody can ever say how much down is... Just keep doing it. You're young. You're beautiful. Don't you want to have a lot of money? Right? So just 
don't worry about how far down is down. When you're buying the Standard & Poor's 500 index, you're buying all the stocks. So it's fine. Just keep doing it because there's no way to know when it's going to turn around and go back up like it did in May of 2009. Right. Hi, Susie. Lisa over here. Wherever Hi, you are. This way. Yes, yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay, so I think I'm your best student. Um, I met you uh, probably about a decade ago. How do I a, look? Um, well, you know, I met you virtually. I, I found out about oh, you as a, <laughs> as a young um, college student who had a lot of uh, credit card debt and was living paycheck to paycheck. And I bought your book and I studied you. I got a pen, a pad, and I, 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 I listened to everything you said. Now, I'm 39 years old, I was a single mother at the time, and the one thing you told me that stuck in my head was, pay yourself first. Yes. And I said, okay, how am I gonna pay myself first when I have all these bills and at the end of the month, I'm negative, I'm negative. So I decided, you know what? These bills will always be here. The cable bill will be here, the phone bill will be here. I'm gonna take the money and I'm gonna pay myself first. In that time, what I did was I took all the credit card debt. But and, wait, stop, because yeah. I'm running out of time. Ask me your question. I'm sorry, the question? Yeah, do you have a question or do you just have a statement? Well, no, there is a question at What's the end it? of it. But I want to I tell you that um, this, the, the question is formulated around debt because right. the, it's, I still have a debt situation. All right, okay? tell me. So with, I've realized that if you pay all your debt, you really can't get rid of it. The way you get rid of it is actually to stop paying it. So what I did, let me, let me tell you the no, truth. No, I know what okay? she did. No, I'll explain it to okay. them. But so what you is your question? So explain it to them because I explained it to my friends and that's actually how I got out of debt very fast. But you ruined your FICO score. No, I, I didn't. It bounced down for a little bit and bounced right back up because I had money. So now, and I stopped buying things. I stopped purchasing things. I lived below my means. I thought, and what then is very, your question? So the, okay, so the question You're is- You're killing me here. Okay, so the question is, in, in all of that time, I accumulated a lot of money. I, don't, I bought a house, I paid it off, and now the only thing I have left is student loan debt. That now I have all this money, and I'm looking at my bank accounts thinking, I don't want to pay that. And so how I got out of my mortgage, I have right, a house stop, paid in Stop, stop, stop. I want you to how stop. I no, no, stop, please that. stop. All right, yes. listen to me. And my credit score is over 700. All right. I want you to listen to me closely. You love okay. me, right? I do, but I don't want to pay that student loan debt. I need you to listen to me. Okay. You may and it's not past due. But. Right. You may have manipulated your way out of credit card debt. No, I'll, wait. I just didn't manipulate. No, really, it. listen to me. Okay. You may have, well, however you got out of credit card debt, you got out of it. Right. However you paid your mortgage off, you did that. Okay. When it comes to student loan debt, all of you listen to me and you listen to me closely. The most dangerous debt in life is student loan debt because it cannot be discharged in bankruptcy or any other way in 99.9% .9 of the cases. And they will just love you if you stop paying it and you go into default, deferment, or forbearance because 40,000 goes into 80,000, grows into 160,000, grows into 250,000 and more. And that's when they come knock, knock, knocking on your door and they have the legal authority without having to sue you. They have the legal authority to garnish your wages, garnish your social security check, and put you through hell, girlfriend. Okay, so I negotiated some, no, some of the- No, I'm not taking any more. I have, listen, listen, I don't care what you did yeah. and what you didn't do. I do not want all of you to, if you have debt because you charged something, wait, I need you to hear this, right? It's not about getting out of the debt. Because when you get out of debt, somebody else has paid that debt for you. And, and there is a financial karma in life. There is. And when you create a situation for yourself, you have to stand in your truth and be responsible to what you did. Because Either a merchant has been stiff for that deck, 
or the bank who lent you the money has been stiffed for that debt, and I'm so glad that you're out of debt. But getting out of debt and accumulating money doesn't mean in the long run you're going to get to keep that money. Listen to me closely. I'm serious. The goal of life is for you to do what's right, not for you to do what's easy. No, wait, 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 wait. No, wait, wait. And I'm not saying, right, that you, that you didn't do what's right or whatever, because I don't have time, really. I have literally like five minutes left, and I'm not going to have this entire audience go into your personal situation. I just can't do that, right? But it's not a message that I want all of you to think about here. It's just, it's just not. I just have to say something before I answer a few more questions, and that's the women that are sitting over here. All right. Recently, I did seven interviews with women who were survivors of domestic abuse. And I did this for the National Domestic Abuse Hotline. And these women were the most extraordinary women and strong women I have ever met. You guys can stand up. Go on, you know who you are. And these women should be our role models, right? Our role models of what's possible. But something very fascinating happened when we were all talking. And what happened was that they all listened to each other's interviews. And one by one, they discovered that they all suffered financial abuse and none of them knew that they had suffered financial abuse because it didn't have a black and blue mark on it. And my, the reason that I'm bringing that up right here is that I don't want us, any of us in this room, to suffer financial abuse and just ignore it. So if you're in a situation where your partner is paying and making you give them their paycheck, controlling every penny, stealing money from you, not letting you have a penny. They all left intelligent, vibrant, great women who came in to the relationships with money. You know, some with a house, some with a job, and they all left without a penny to their name, the clothes on their back, and their children in their arms. What's fabulous is they're all making it now. And they're all making it on their own. So for the national... <laughs> so I just want to tell you, you need to make sure that if you're in a relationship, please be honest with yourselves. Domestic financial abuse is rampant. To be a strong, secure, and smart woman, you need to have your own credit cards. You need to have your own bank accounts. You need to be able to see where every penny is being spent. You need to pay the bills jointly. You need to look at the tax returns together before you put your name on it, and then you find out that he or she committed fraud. All right? And you can do that. And I just want to say it's good to see you guys again, and I'm honored to be in your presence, really. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me see where I am here. A few more questions. Who has the mic? Yes. Hi, Susie. Wanted to see if you could address the HSAs. Um, when you talk about planning for retirement, that's the one piece that you didn't touch on, and I All think right, it's very so important. All right, so an for... HSA is a health savings account which is also known as a high deductible insurance account for your health. Does your employer put in any money as a seed for your HSA? No. 
When they don't put in money as a seed, they then can become a little bit difficult because of how they work. If your employer seeds your HSA, I love HSAs. Too complicated to explain in five minutes. If your employer does not seed, I don't love them as much. But if you do not have a choice, in HSA, and I know I'm talking above your heads right now for many of you, is the best retirement account out there because when you go to take your money out at 65, you get a tax deduction for the money that you put in, and when you take it out, you get to take it out tax-free if it's for a qualified medical expense. I love them. You just have to have enough money to pay your bills. Um, sorry if you don't know what I'm talking about, but that's it. One more, and that is it. To Life insurance, let me talk about insurance. Listen to me. Life insurance was never meant to be a permanent deed. It was only meant to be there during your younger years before you had money in case you suffered a loss of somebody who was financially dependent on you or you on them. The only type of life insurance that I think you should get is term insurance. When you go into the book, Women and Money, you are going to find that there is a website that you get to go to. It's actually suzyorman.com slash women. And on that website, you are going to find a debt eliminator, you're going to find uh, expense tracker, you're going to find all kinds of tools that you can use to figure everything out in the actual book, Women and Money. I explain to you in great detail exactly how much insurance you need, how long you need insurance for, and if you just follow that book, I am telling you, all of your questions will be answered. Last but not least, because we didn't have time to touch on it, every single one of you in this room needs an advanced directive, a durable power of attorney for health care, a living revocable trust, and a will. You need that. Children, minors, cannot inherit money, people. So if you have kids and you leave your money to your minor kids, that money will go into a blocked account until they are 18 or they do a court order to get that money. A will is not enough. A will is simply a document that says where your assets go upon your death. And it does it in the most ineffective cost way possible. What happens if you don't die? Eventually, you will. <laughs> but what if you don't die and you are in a car accident or you have a stroke or you become incapacitated ladies? Who is going to pay your bills for you? Who is going to write your checks for you? A will is not going to help you. You need a living, revocable trust. Living, you do it while you are alive. Revocable, you can change it any time you want. Trust is the name of the document. I have, in fact, my mother, let's say, has a home in California, or even New York, but let's just say California, because my friends from California are here. Paula Canny, who's the best defense lawyer. I just have to say one other thing about Paula. Paula, stand up for one second, seriously, right? <laughs> Paula is also one of my oldest friends in life. I want to just tell you what this woman is doing. She is an incredible criminal defense lawyer in California who is now going from county to county to make the laws change so that women in prison have their tampons paid for by the state. Because right? the women in prison have to pay for their own tampons, and they don't have the money to do so. I don't care where you are. If you're a woman, you deserve dignity, either inside prison or outside, and that woman is trying to do that. 
so there you are in the state of California, or you have a two, my mother has a $200,000 home, and she wants me to have that home. I'm living in that home with her. And the title to that home is Ann Orman. And my mother dies, and she has a will that says, I'm to get that house. She's dead. I have a piece of paper. How do I get the title of that house from her name into my name? I have to give it to a lawyer who takes it down to probate court. In the state of California, that will be six months to two years for a judge to validate the will, making sure mommy wants me to have it, and then sign the title from her name over to me. In the state of California, that will cost me about seventeen to 19 thousand dollars statutory what happens if i don't have that money the house can be sold to pay the lawyers like paula right <laughs> so anyway right she likes that idea right so do you understand that the house can be sold what could mommy have done she could have taken the steps while she was alive to transfer the title of the house from her name into the title of the trust, held for her benefit while she was alive, my benefit after she died. She dies, I get it two weeks later, maybe $800 in transfer fees. Are you crazy? If you have a living revocable trust with an incapacity clause and something goes wrong, you've already decided who can sign for you, people, things go wrong. When you go to susieorman.com slash women, you will also find a place that you can get, this one you do have to pay for, but it's $69, $2,500 worth of state-of-the-art documents that are good in all 50 states. They are my will, my trust. If you looked at my documents, that's what these documents are. So when you go on there and you do it and you get your activation code, you get to do it and come back anytime you want. Here's what's great about the activation code. Share that activation code with your mothers and your fathers and your sisters and your brothers and anybody you want. So the goal here is every one of you has the documents in place today to protect your tomorrows. The goal of tonight was for you to be secure. Here's what I want to leave you with. Every single one of us enters this world with two wings. One wing is the wing of grace. That wing is flapping by your side 24 hours a day, seven days a week from now until eternity. The wing that you bring into this world is the wing of self-effort. When that wing of self-effort flaps equally as hard as that wing of grace, I promise you, you will have flight into the world of unlimited possibilities where anything and everything is possible. Financial freedom is your birthright. It is your birthright to be strong, smart, and secure women. It is your birthright to have power over your money. It is your birthright to have power over your lives. And you can do that right here and right now. You just have to make the decision to be the powerful women you were born to be. May financial freedom bless each and every one of your doorsteps. And may God bless each and every one of you. Thank you, Apollo! Yes.